Welcome to our fourth and final video on sizing steel wide flange frames from tables. In the previous videos, we used Excel as a preprocessor for load computations and to organize our sizing procedures. Then we used tables to size beams for stiffness. Then in the third video, we used tables to size wide flange beams for moment capacity. And now we're going to use the output of all of that detailed sizing process to verify the spans and proportions guidelines for steel wide flange beams. So you'll recall that in chapter one, under the design process, we had a series of guidelines for spans and proportions, and those spans and proportions included steel wide flange beams. We're now going to use the output of what we've done in this sizing procedure to go back and verify that in fact those guidelines make sense. You will recall that we have been sizing steel wide flange beams for a steel structure with a 30 by 30 column grid. So the spacing between that column and that column is 30 feet. There's another 30 feet this way. And for the columns right along this line, there's also a 30 foot spacing. Here we have joists spanning in this direction, single loaded girders and double loaded girders. And we have sized those three kinds of beams for the roof loads and for floor loads. You will recall that for steel beams, we don't customarily need to be too concerned about shear because the material is inherently so strong in shear, but we do need to be concerned about sizing for stiffness to avoid excessive deflection, which if nothing else is a perceptual issue, particularly relative to floors, but it's also a ponding issue relative to roofs in the sense that if we have a roof that's too flexible, as rain begins to accumulate, it will deflect more and create somewhat of a bowl shape, in which case it will accumulate even more rain and it becomes actually not just a perceptual issue, but a structural failure issue. Then we need also size for moment capacity. We sized for stiffness under live load and we set a certain limit on the deflection under live load. We size for moment capacity under full factored load because we want to make sure that the structure does not fail um, under those loads. The spreadsheet that we went through looks something like this. So we had uh, an overall heading of sizing steel beams from tables. We did some pre-calculations in Excel to calculate the loads and we're also using Excel to organize information into which we can put our results. Then we did a sizing operation called sizing for stiffness, which led to a certain beam size being required, some minimal beam size for each of these situations. So here we have roof joist, single loaded roof girder, double loaded roof girder, and so forth. And here we have the ultimate sizes for those wide flanges for those situations. We were able to do that sizing operation using tables like this which for various weights of beams give uh, a sequence of stiff, cross-sectional stiffnesses or what we call the moment of inertia, which is the formal term for cross-sectional stiffness. And I'll remind you that the cross-sectional stiffness was lim listed in this table in descending order and things were bunched into groups where for this member, that is the one that has the bold lettering. That is the lightest weight member of this entire group, and it also uh, has the highest moment of inertia, which can happen if you make the beam really deep. It can still be quite light and still have a high moment of inertia. So we did that stiffness sizing operation using this table. And then we did the moment strength uh, sizing where we took the factored loads and we went to a table that looks something like this. It's called the ZX table, but the part of it that we were using was the moment design moment capacity in kip feet, which is in this column right here. So here we have the shape, the cross-sectional shape and the corresponding design moment. 
Now we want to take all that information that we got and we want to go back and verify some tables that we've been using for design purposes. In, in chapter one we talked about corrugated decking and then wide flange beams, both simple span and cantilever. And what we've been sizing is simple span, so we're going to focus on that and keep in mind that we said sort of the shallowest section we're ever likely to use is an L over 28. Uh, the heaviest one that we're likely to use under normal circumstances might be an L over 18. Again, these are guidelines that are accounting not just for pure structural issues, but are attempting to account for economic issues also. So we might have some beams that are shallower than L over 28 that would work, but we might throw them out because there's some other structural system that can do that job more economically. Likewise, we might have some beams that tend to be deeper than L over 18, but we might choose a somewhat less efficient beam that is more in the order of L over 18 in order to keep the overall height of the building down. So again, all these guidelines here are approximations and we're going to talk that to account for a variety of economic factors and we're going to talk about that as we go through um, discussing the results of this sizing operation. Okay, this is a summary of the sizing operations that we've done so far on this 30 by 30 grid. Um, I've collected them all together and slightly reorganized them in the following sense. Before we started with roof joist, then we went to single loaded roof girders, then we went to double loaded roof girders, but we're not doing it in exactly that sequence uh, in this presentation. And the reason is that we want to uh, look at this entire set of data in a monotonic relationship to total factored load. So you'll notice the factored loads are 0.297 kips per foot, 0.917, 1.155, 1 1.823, and so forth. So what I've done is I have reversed in this table the double loaded roof girder and I have put it further down the list and I have slid the floor joist up because I wanted to keep this monotonic relationship where the total factored load is increasing from top to bottom. And I'm doing that because I want to demonstrate uh, several trends here. Okay, so here I have the list of sections that we came up with to satisfy the stiffness criterion, and here we have the list that we put together to satisfy strength. Now, <clears throat> one of the things I want you to notice is that in no case does strength govern the depth. Depth is an extremely uh, uh, sensitive factor when it comes to deflection. So we might have some beams that are heavier in order to give adequate strength, but not usually beams that are deeper. And in fact, when you look here, we see we needed a W12 right here, but a W10 worked okay for strength. Um, likewise, we needed a 14 here and a 12 there, a 16 here and a 12 there. Uh, and then when we get to the more heavily loaded ones, we begin to see the depths more equal. So. Here we have an 18 and an 18, and a 21 and a 21, and a 24 and a 24. The one place where strength was the governing issue is here the weight was 84, and here for stiffness it was only 76. So this leads us to one of the sort of generalizations that I've alluded to already, and I probably will several more times in the future which is that more often than not for most of the things you will design, um, stiffness will more likely govern than strength. You have to design for both, but stiffness often governs. It also is the one that we take first in our sizing operation because it's not iterative. It's based purely on the live load and as a consequence, no matter what the size of the beam is, we don't have to repeat that sizing operation, and that sizing operation informs um, the initial sizing of the beam when we go to check it for strength. So as I mentioned, in no case for this particular sizing operation were the beams 
deeper for strength than for stiffness. So I'm going to just come down and, and point out that these are the final depths that we achieved in our sizing operation. And you'll notice it goes 12 inches, 14, 16, 18, 21, 24. In other words, when we align these as a monotonically increasing function of load, we see that the depth of the beam is also increasing monotonically. Uh, this is the common pattern that you're going to encounter. Now, we're going to look at the depth and we're going to come over and we're going to rewrite it in terms of this kind of um, expression, which is the one that we used in the guidelines tables in chapter one. So we're going to express depth as a function of length divided by something or other. So in this case, we got 30 which turns out to be the length of the beam in inches, which is 360 inches, divided by the depth, which is 12 inches. So when we divide the length of 360 inches by the depth of 12 inches, we get 30. In other words, the depth is L over 30. Then we go L over 26, L over 23, L over 20, 17, and 15, and so forth. Uh, the deepest being L over 15. Now, when we go back and look at the guidelines, so let's go up here and see what they were. They go from L over 28 to L over 18. So I've written in here for the guidelines L over 28 and L over 18. Now, you'll notice this is shallower than that. And in fact, when you do this design for a 40 foot by 40 foot grid, you get an even more dramatic result this turns out to be L over 40. Um, in almost no, no case do we actually ever use those beams though. And the reason is that when you start getting beams that shallow, open web joist are always more efficient, which is why you will see example after example when you drive down the highway and you look at a multi-story building, you will frequently see the floor supported by beams and then the roof supported by open web joists. And that's simply a reflection that in the, in the roofs, the loads have gotten low enough that it's no longer practical and logical to use a wide flange beam. So one way of thinking of it is, in order to make this wide flange beam deeper, we would have to roll it much thinner. Then the solid web would become more vulnerable to buckling. And in the end, it's more sensible to use uh, web members that are open web so that you get better lateral stability and a more efficient performance. So this is L over 30, but in fact the guidelines say L over 28, and that's because L over 28 is about the shallowest you ever use steel beams. On the other hand, this one at this end came out as L over 15, but our guideline says L over 18, and again, this is an economic argument, and it's based on the, the argument that, well, L over 15 might be the optimum, but we might be better off choosing a somewhat shallower beam, which will be heavier, but it allows us to make our building uh, not so tall. So the desire to keep the overall height of the building down will often motivate us to use an L over 18. On the other hand, there are situations where we have enormously high loads, and it turns out to be economical and efficient, to even violate a rule like L over 15. But again, our guidelines are pretty good indicators of the range that you're typically going to be operating in in terms of spans and proportions. Uh, the last comment I wanna make is uh, students, architecture students and architecture designers are often driven by certain philosophical viewpoints, one of which is Minimalism is wonderful and everything should always be minimal. Um, from a structural logic point of view and an economic point of view, that is not necessarily true. So you'll notice here, for example, the minimal beam would be L over 28. So students often go into these tables and they say, well, the tables say right here, I can get away with L over 28. So I'm never going to use a beam that's any deeper than that. But in fact, that L over 28 is only valid in really lightly loaded situations. As soon as you go to more normal loads or really heavy loads,
you want proportions more in the range of L over 18. When in doubt, it always makes sense to do your drawings with the deeper proportions, figuring that you can always throttle back from that at some point. What you don't want to do is always assume these shallower proportions because you're going to be constantly revising them upward and you're going to have all kinds of arguments with your engineer who is frustrated that you're misusing the guidelines. So keep in mind L over 28 for lightly loaded situations like roof joist and L over 18 for heavily loaded situations such as double loaded floor girders. Finally, there's one other trend that I would like for you to note here. If we take the load supported, which in this case is in kips per foot, so we need to convert it to pounds per foot, uh, and divide it by the weight, the self weight of the beam, which is 14. So if we divided 297 pounds per foot by 14 pounds per foot, we get 21.2 which is um, an indicator of the structural efficiency of this beam. So what it's saying is it's supporting 21 times its own weight. Uh, for most beams, that's a pretty poor performance. And by the way, it's another indicator of why we don't use beams like this for roofing situations. We use open web joists because this is pretty bad performance. Now, if you tried to hold 21 times your own weight, uh, you'd be pretty impressed with yourself. And, but then if you had to hold that kind of weight where you're functioning as a beam, you'd be astounded at yourself. But for a steel beam, this is pretty poor performance. And to give you an indication, when you get up near the top here, you'll notice that this really heavy, heavily loaded beam has a much higher efficiency. It's supporting almost 84 times its own weight. So um, this is a trend I want you to note. The more heavily loaded the beam is, the deeper it tends to be, and therefore the better the lever arm of the beam, and therefore the more efficiently the beam performs. So in heavily loaded situations, you would expect your beams to be more efficient. That ends our video on using the output of detailed sizing operations to verify the spans and proportions guidelines for steel wide flange beams.